morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 442 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yeah. Today, recording day is Wednesday, August 7th, 2024, and it is going to be a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. I am your host, the Eager Beaver, pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver. And uh, not with me today is uh, my good friend, Mr. Beersley. He sent me a message earlier this morning saying that he had not slept as well as he should have. And um, if I was going to ask him, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Um, I think his response would have been something like, it's gone to shit. Um, So... He is taking uh, a day for self-care, which, of course, you know, uh, we very much support here at the Beaver Lodge. Self-care is very, very important, and uh, if you can make time for it, you always should. So um, you get a solo beaver today. (laughs) So uh, I'll do my best. Uh, Didn't uh, Last time I didn't stick the landing. This time I didn't actually stick the mount. For some reason, uh, I was caught in a loop uh, on the production thing. So, uh, yes, uh, those of you who are here and uh, saw things looping around and going like, what the heck's going on? Uh, Yeah, it it was an interesting thing uh, happening where I was just uh, looping and it was asking me to press a button for the countdown. But it's like, but I've already done the countdown. Why do I have to press it? And it was a button I'd never seen before. So I was a little confused because, well, I'm easily confused. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but hey, figured it out. Uh, I'm still new here when it comes to producing. Usually, Mr. Grizzly does that. So, uh, 
but you know, uh, if we're going to do this every day, then every now and then, now and then one of us is going to need a day off and the other one needs to know how to figure out the other one being me, uh, <laughs> how to do this. So, uh, I'm getting better at it though, kids. I'm getting better at it. Uh, good morning to uh, all the kids and cubs who have joined us this morning. Kit Elaine, Kit Wishful. Hey, so nice to see you. Kit PNC Bio, Kit Lada M, uh, Kit Vim. There you go. Yeah, let's see who else do we have here with us. Uh, Kit Carol. Yeah. Hello, Nona. Lovely to see you. Thank you for coming today. Kit Dan. Hey, my friend. Ah. <laughs> yeah really <laughs> good morning to you all and don't worry douglas i thought i was going nuts for a second uh, uh i was too there <laughs> kid linda it's the intro that never ends yes it goes on and on my friends <laughs> kid cassie Ah, uh, yeah, Miss. Hello, and all the family. Hello, Mateo. Hello, Jazzy. Hello, Rain, and uh, hello, Mohan. I hope you're all doing well. And uh, Kit Tabby G, yeah, pop it in. Hello, Kit Saucy. You are not late. There you go. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, beautiful day. Going to be here at uh, the Beaver Lodge. Uh, so very excited about that. And going to go play some uh, tennis uh, a little later today. Get to play some doubles. Uh, which is uh, kind of fun because uh, I'm new to doubles uh, and uh, I like it. I have to say I like it. It's uh, I, I thought I would sweat less playing doubles because technically you covered half the court and last week was the first time. And um, no, <laughs> so it's a good workout. Uh, plus, since we're four on the court, we get the court for two hours instead of one. So, yay! You actually get to play an actual match with like regular sets and rather than a pro set to eight. So it, it's kind of fun. I like it. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, let's see. Big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss P Mysteries from Corver Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. <sighs> Kits and Cubs. Uh, my mental health, uh, doing much better today. Uh, I had a really, 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 really uh, bad uh, 24 to 36 hours um, uh, at one point. Uh, yeah. And, um, Fortunately, uh, the help of good friends, uh, out of the blue, uh, Kit Hugh actually uh, gave me a call uh, because he was uh, coming to town for something, and uh, we ended up having a lunch brunch uh, together, and it uh, was exactly uh, what this beaver needed uh, as a little pick-me-up. So um, thank you for being Thank you for being a friend. <laughs> uh, love it. Um, so yeah, doing much better today. Um, actually feeling like my old self actually. So, uh, my usual self, which is nice because, um, uh, yeah, I, I was very sulky and sad and, uh, I actually stress cried yesterday. So, um, twice actually. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, today much better. All right. The news. Um, there is lots going on. Of course, the big, big political news is uh, south of us because uh, um, now uh, the prospective uh, Democratic nominee, because you couldn't say that before because she hadn't been confirmed, but now she is, uh, Kamala Harris announced her uh, vice presidential pick. It seems that uh, in the end, it uh, came down to three people, Senator Mark Kelly from Arizona, who's a astronaut, um, Tim Walls from Minnesota, a governor that uh, sort of has been developing a reputation as America's dad, and uh, he's the one that kind of kicked off the whole weird thing that stuck. And uh, Governor Josh Shapiro from Pennsylvania, um, who uh, Pennsylvania is a big state uh, in terms of the Electoral College. It has 19 votes, which is the fifth most uh, tied with another state. So it's an important state. Uh, and uh, Josh Shapiro um, is Jewish, which could shore up the ticket uh, if we're uh, if uh, a political cons cons if a political concern for the ticket was what was going on in uh, uh, Israel and Gaza, and uh, the party felt that it needed um, uh, to send a signal to the Jewish community um, that it's with them, 
that could have been a way they they go uh, that they could have gone as well. Um, but she ended up picking Tim Walls, who I didn't know much about until a few weeks ago, and uh, kept uh, seeing him in clips. And uh, he's got the thing that uh, Pete Buttigieg has in that he's a very very effective communicator, uh, and he can speak to the middle because uh, when he was uh, before he was governor, he, he was a representative uh, in the in Congress. And uh, he represents a rural area, uh, and uh, oh, typically more Republican voting area. Um, but he was able to break through, so he has the ability um, to be a channel back and forth between uh, two different groups. Um, he's quite progressive, uh, pretty much an honorary Canadian, to be totally honest, uh, in terms of a. Uh, a lot of his political policies, uh, which will do a lot as well to shore up um, uh, the more younger, youthful, uh, militant vote, probably similar people that like Bernie Sanders might like him, maybe not as much as Bill Bernie Sanders. He's not that far uh, on the spectrum, but um, to, to get the, the feeling that they might be getting uh, some slightly more progressive policies. Um, than they had hoped for, could create some buzz there. Uh, seems to be an overall good choice. Doesn't seem to have uh, much controversy. Um, you know, worked as a teacher, uh, which could uh, put a little target on him because uh, we know how uh, a particular moment loves teachers. Sorry, while I have a little tea. By the way, <clears throat> celebrating the Olympics. <laughs> Um, yes, exactly. Exactly. Kipinsia Bio, Minnesota may as well be Southern Canada. It's like it's, it's, it's honorary Canada, right? So yes, Kitlin M. Walsh. Exactly. Yes. It's like having Brittle Star for VP. Th that is a very, very good way to put it. I, I, yes, I would agree. I would agree. That's a uh, very, very good. Um, so, you know, he, he, he's affable, um, you know, he, he does have that dad vibe, uh, which is cool. Uh, but he was a teacher. Uh, he was a coach. So like a little Doug Ford in terms of some folkiness, folksiness, and a little, uh, a little Justin Trudeau uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, knowing to, what to do with uh, unruly children. And the opposing party is basically the high school from which nobody ever graduated. So, you know, kind of perfectly suited in terms of tone to handle that. Um, he was also uh, a member of the National Guard uh, for 24 years uh, and uh, rose uh, to a level that he, um, a rank. Uh, that I cannot remember off the top of my head. Um, but so, well, I mean, you can say that, um, you know, he, he does have some uh, military background. Often that's a place where, you know, the Republicans would like to go if you want to explore a weakness, you know, weak on the military. Or not. So I'm not sure, you know, it's a, a Buttigieg or, uh, or um, you know, General Schwarzkopf. Uh, level, um, but 24 years, right, and, and rose through the ranks there as well. So another interesting thing about him is that he's 60, she's 59. I know we're not supposed to talk about looks, but, but she does not look like she's one year younger than he is in age. So that whole old thing, because you got Trump running in the back going, going anyone is not old. <laughs> 78's not old now. <laughs> it's like, I was like, well, Tim Wallace is 60, so literally Trump could be his dad. And she looks younger. All the stuff that they said about old and now come back to bite them. So uh, this seems to be a 
pretty good ticket. Um, they made their debut at a rally in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, which was something that was leading people to think that maybe Josh Shapiro would be the pick, given that he's the governor of Pennsylvania. But it turns out that that's just where they decided to hold the first event because it's an important swing state. And it's, it, it's well, it, of all the swing states, it's the one with the highest number of electoral college votes. So it's the one that they absolutely have to win, um, according to them, right? That's in Georgia. Um, so Georgia, it's only because we don't consider it a swing state because it it's only swung once. And as we say in French, une fois n'est pas coutume, uh, once does not make a habit. <laughs> or once is not a trend. Uh, so they held the event there. And uh, it was a crowd of 10,000 that showed up. And they were loud. Uh, so the whole um, Trump thing in 2016, when he was having these big rallies with these big crowds and sort of like the, this era of inevit inevitability that was uh, around him that he was uh, manufacturing uh, with those rallies. Um, there's a little bit of that going on here. In this case, it's kind of organic, which is very interesting. Um, in my lifetime, this is the most, ex well, am I going to say that? Because there was, there was lots of excitement for Barack Obama, I have to admit. But there, it's all, see, I can't tell if there's more excitement now just because the stakes are higher. Because when it was Barack Obama, um, this undercurrent wasn't where it was, where it is now. Um, and then there was just excitement, you know. Uh, more, the excitement was literally more hopeful when, you know, when he was saying hope and, you know, the, that iconic poster and image. It really was that. It was, you know, there was an opportunity to do something that had never did, been done before, uh, you know, and try to, you know, doesn't fix everything, but, you know, when we would talk about reconciliation here in Canada, like this, that, that would be, you know, a big moment of reconciliation in the United States where some of their history is concerned. Um, but this time, it's, there is history to be made, um, first female president, right? Um, but there's a, a level of stakes that sort of makes, um, uh, makes it, makes it seem uh, that if you see a reaction like this, where people are are coming out, it's almost like the backlash to the blacklash. You know, there was a president. And, you know, not only he, not only was he not white, well, one hundred percent white, and uh, not only was he not only one term. And not only did he give people health care, which for some reason really seems to piss off Republicans, um, you know, and it was like, oh my God, we can't have that again. And it was a pendulum swing. And we got the second non-white president in U.S. history. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. <laughs> we got Agent Orange. Uh, and that was like one term was like, whoa, whoa, boy. Yeah. Okay. And there seemed to have been a backlash to that. And a lot of people are trying, are seeing this perhaps as a moment, right? If there can be enough enthusiasm and the Democrats could win and can win sizably enough, um, that might kill this Trumpism thing. That doesn't mean there won't be another person that comes around um, and tries to sell some type of version of what you know the the, you know, the, the 2028 version of this will be. Um, but that whole cult of personality, charisma type thing that he had that 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 goes, and you know, there's a rejection of that, and you know. Uh, 
maybe the the brain trust up there that's trying to get its own way and say, well, okay, well, that's not going to work anymore. Let's see what else is there. And we can maybe get past this. Uh, let's establish an autocratic state thing. Um, ideally, of course, uh, it would be that there was so much enthusiasm about that, that uh, down ballot and all over that people uh, really make a, an effort to come out and when you add to the ballot initiatives. Uh, you know, I mean, if it could be a situation where, you know, a majority, uh, the 60 seat Senate and, you know, the, the majority in the House and whatnot uh, could happen, then, you know, in four years, especially with all the powers that the Supreme Court just gave, they could really clean house. In that case, if they wanted to unpack the court, they really could, because there would be nothing to stop them. Uh, but yeah, right now uh, we have this is the excitement phase. So apparently, there are going to be making stops in seven states, uh, all key swing states. I think most of them in um, in five days. So it's going to be quite a schedule. Um, to try to maintain that momentum, maintain that buzz. Uh, in terms of fundraising, uh, things are going really well in terms of volunteers signing up uh, really well. Um, so said there's there's excitement on the ground about this campaign. Uh, a lot of people are saying that maybe not since the days of Kennedy uh, in terms of that, uh, the, the amount that it's, uh, it's vibrating. Uh, whether or not that can be sustained is a, is another thing. Uh, the advantage that they have is that uh, this particular ticket, since it came by so late, um, it, it's the closest to the Canadian style election that we're going to get in the United States because you know they have this whole year primaries. Like we we have somebody say, you know, go see the governor general. Okay, thirty six days from now, this is all you get, and you know, we get in a, and then we said, okay, that we only need to hear about it for that long. Even though, of course, you know, uh, since Harper came around and now with PP on steroids, it's now the permanent campaign. But in terms of our elections, it's that. But you know, when you have all the primaries and and all that kind of stuff, and it's 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 almost a two year thing. For them. So I mean, you get to see them a lot. You know, you have. Um, I think that's the one of the things in our election. I like that they're shorter, but sometimes I think they're too short because they don't give enough time for. Uh, something to blow up if something does blow up and then see how people handle it um so in the united states however there's it's almost it's too much time for things to blow up and then everybody says oh my god it's like all this awful research and all these scandals and everything and ugh, they're all they're all horrible um but um i'm one of the few people who did like uh, uh what conservatives are probably going to consider a mistake but that harper uh, in his uh, first election, in the election that he lost to Justin Trudeau when he called a length, lengthy election um, because he had built up a big war chest and figured he could just really hammer, hammer, hammer. And it, uh, what it did is it just gave time for uh, some things to slip up because when it's just 32 days, a little scandalette happens. And, you know, if it doesn't really catch on right away, it just dies. Whereas in a longer campaign, you know, oh, well, maybe that can last for two or three days and maybe we can keep digging and see if something else comes up. Uh, so, you know, things like the barbaric practices, cultural stitch line, snitch line had a lot more time to play out and we got to see how people would react and, uh, it created more opportunities, uh, for, you know, ebbs and flows in the race and, you know, whoops, somebody tripped over a hurdle here. And so, and, uh, I believe in that race, the lead, uh, changed. Uh, three times. The NDP led at uh, at one point, the Conservatives led at one point, and the Liberals led at one point, and we ultimately settled on the Liberals. But that gave us enough time to see under pressure, under the glare of the spotlight, over a sustained period of time, not just one month, where you can, you know, you can plan a different policy announcement one month, one month to keep the narrative moving. But if you do like two, two and a half, that's a little trickier. Um, yeah. Exactly. The NC Kitlin Nichols, the one that Harper called that was longer, felt like it was uh, lasted forever for no reason. I like the shorter election period. And like I said, 
I like I see it. I, I see the reason why people like the shorter one, like politics. Like, okay, you know what? We're all going to concentrate for thirty-two days, and then let's leave us alone for the next four years. Fine, <laughs> I get that. Uh, I just think a little extra runway uh, gets a better chance to evaluate how people do under pressure, and uh, gives a chance a little, to just just that little extra bit of scrutiny that you need to say, oh, well, wait a minute, oh, in a crisis, can we really depend on this person? Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. So, I like I like the long word, but then again, I'm a political geek, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is a it's a really interesting ticket. It's going to be um, fun to see how this plays out because the context that we're going into this now is completely different as well. I mean, we it looked like we were going to go for a rematch. You know, old man versus old man, you know, um, bickering about their, their golf games. Uh, and all of a sudden, um, there is an energy. Uh, it will be about policies to a certain extent. It's not just going to be uh, Donald Trump is a bad person, so don't elect him. There's going to be other stuff. There are going to be ballot initiatives that are going to help people come out. Uh, there's going to be... Um, uh, Lots of grassroots activity, you know, it's like men for Kamala and women for Kamala and, and all that kind of stuff uh, that's already organizing. If you're on social media, social media is not the real world, as we learned <laughs> recently uh, with Phoebe's platforms. Uh, but there does seem to, uh, the, the fundraising dollars and the number of the people signing up to volunteer and that kind of stuff doesn't lie, right? 10,000 people in a stadium in Philadelphia. Uh, for the launch, the official launch, doesn't lie. So, um, tables have turned a little bit. There's a narrative uh, switch, and it doesn't really look uh, like the Republicans were prepared for it. Pardon me. Because when Biden uh, stepped aside, uh, the reactions were like, well, wait a minute, you can't do that. Like, what about all our merch? We already, what about all our plans, our strategies? And they were even talking about like trying to stop it in court. And I guess they didn't really make a, all that big an effort at that because uh, never heard about that again. Um, so it's almost like we're just going to say Biden's old guy. Biden's got to go. Biden's old squad. Is, he's got to go. He'll never go. And uh, we'll just ride that pony all the way to the finish line. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. You did what we asked? You got rid of him? You can't do that. Hey. <laughs> and then Weird started catching on. And it's like, we're not weird. We're not. And it's like and everything they do to show that they're not weird only ends up making them look weirder. And it's a similar thing going on here in Canada as well. You know, it's like we saw weird and like this not working. And hey, why not? Hey, it's like it's a common thing in politics. I mean, that's the entire conservative movement. They see it work somewhere and then they take it and they spread it up. Well, okay, weird is working there. PP is no less weird. I mean, come on. Jeez. Mr. Anti Charisma. Ooh. So, um, and it's bothering them now. The said, you know, conservatives try to try saw it and trying to head off at the past. Uh, you know, they tried their wacko thing, and and I mean, yes, it's like yes, but no. It's it's so mean spirited when they're doing it, right? So it's not the trick is to disarm, right? If you fear them. Because you give them power. So if you portray them as something to mock, it's like, that's just weird. That's just creepy. Is that like, is it just me or is that, this is weird, right? Right? They don't know what to do with that. They don't know what to do with that. It, it's a, it's a zigging when they were expecting zagging. You know, he's a felon. He's a criminal. He's a rapist. You can't vote for that. He's not you know, the type of role model you'd want your children to have. It's like, yeah. But weird, that sticks. 
And then you get into, so if we're in Canada and it's like, you know, that's going over there. And, but in Canada, instead of that, we get the pundit class, you know, giving us a, just as, you know, I think it was Scott Reed who had put out a tweet saying something like, you know, that someone else's stick, find your own. It's like, <laughs> we don't do this for style points. We don't do this, you know, to be the most creative. It fits and it works. That's pretty much all we care about. We're talking about pure strategy. It's like, it's not like, oh my God, look at this great idea. It's really working. Well, I guess we can't use that idea now. <laughs> I mean, it's like, no, it's like, let's roll the dice, give it a whirl, see if it works. Right. So this, the, the media here, I, I, I don't know what it is yet, but it's like, I like we're Canadians that want their democracy to remain a democracy that uh, like the idea of the cultural mosaic, um, who are not all for parties uh, that say, you know, it's like assimilate or send them back or deport them back to their homelands. Right? <laughs> we, 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 we don't care about originality. We're not trying to figure out what works in order to also entertain you journalists and members of the public pundit class and hosts of TV shows. It's like, we, we want to do the thing that connects with the average Canadian to get them to see that this guy is unacceptable as an option. That's it's purely pragmatic and utilitarian here. If it sticks, if it fits, if it works, use it. Again, as I like to say, Find the spot on the body where it hurts when you press, and when you do it, just dig right in there. It's just, I don't know, man. I don't know. So, speaking of this, um, Pyepolyev, as uh, Mr. Grizzly mentioned on the show, uh, an account Trivia 280, I believe it was. Um, who just a Canadian citizen. Member of, uh, actually, from uh, Canada's disability community, actually. And uh, the reason I mentioned that is going to, uh, is going to be obvious uh, pretty soon. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, was just like saw these things happening and then you know decided to do a little uh investigative work of their own and figured something out noticed a trend and there's been an attempt at a counter narrative in that some of those accounts that were still active when you went, one of the message on top of that was sort of like a pro-climate change message. So they're turning out, oh, see, they accuse these of being conservative bots, but you know, these were really liberal bots, and this was like an, you know, a smear campaign type thing. Um, maybe that would be very dark Justin-ish if that was indeed the case. But let's assume, let's assume that flooding the internet with all these uh, pears given me so much buzz and as a northerner i've never felt more understood and seen um type buzz in order to then say dbu is bot part i mean we kind of we all knew it but you know or suspected it so i don't think wanting to creating that much of a positive buzz and as a setup 
first for something else would probably be a best strategic choice in that case. So I have no facts. My deductive reason leads me to believe that it's less likely to be a situation that they were liberal bots who uh, on one occasion decided to promote a pro-PP message in order to create the impression that he was using bots. Um, and just whoever runs those accounts, they're for sale. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, what's the next message we got paid for? And if the next message is completely incongruent with the message below, it doesn't matter. Right? <laughs> it's like, it's just a paycheck. Whether the message is pro this, anti that, like this, it's the same money. It's the same amount of work. It's no skin off their teeth. Right? So, um, we're, again, when we're talking about weird, it's like, this is weird. Like, but, like, even if you sit there and you think about it, right? Kirkland Lake is a pretty small town. You're, there are no direct flights from any major area. Um, all those accounts are listed as being like from everywhere, Honolulu, some places in Europe, New York State, New Mexico. Just, you know, it's like, I just got back from the rally. I mean, there's really? <laughs> <laughs> you just got back from Kirkland Lake, Honolulu. Just got back, really? All ready to talk about it? It's like you'd probably still be in some airport lounge somewhere. <laughs> so you know, it's on its face, it's so weak. And then it's like fourteen thousand or however many of these accounts uh, for like a curling arena that holds depending on who, who's talking about it, like 114 to 200 people. Um, it's like, clearly, clearly it's not real. Like, if you're going to do this type of thing, right, wouldn't you just do it on 50 bots? <laughs> like, if you wanted it to make it seem real, right? So it's just so weird to think that you could flood the internet like that for a rally in Kirkland Lake and that nobody would notice and that you would be considered uh, <sighs> that you could be taken seriously. <sighs> but they do it anyway. Right, this it's all this effort to manufacture inevit inevitability. It's, 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 it's don't liberals and new democrats and all of that kind of stuff don't even bother to go vote, don't even bother like this. Look at this overwhelming support, look at this overwhelming support. There's, there's nothing you can do about it, it's in the bag. Stay home, you know, just get ready to accept that the next four years are going to be, and, and that's it. Um, Twitter's not real life. Twitter's not real life. So you can't, uh, you, you can't run with that. You have to make it. <laughs> Carol, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Um, yes, um, Kit T. Wigmore asks, is the Kirkland Lake bot thing worth a Fed investigation? I personally believe so. Um, now, here's the thing. I don't know literally what can be done. Like, this is, this stuff is so new to me, uh, and it's so new out there that I don't know um, what uh, recommendations are. Uh, or if there are any um, uh, policies or regulations or procedures for this type of thing, uh, 
You'll remember when we talked a few months ago about uh, how the conservatives were using their merchandise site. Uh, you know, like we have questions. You know, are merchandise sales considered political donations? And if not, why not? Because if you want to keep dark money out of politics, you know, you know, saying, okay, well, you can't make a direct donation to the party if you're a foreign national or over this limit. But hey, if you want to buy 10,000 to 10,000 of our t-shirts in one shot, especially if we don't have to actually print them and deliver them, um, just go to our merch site. So you'd think you'd want to close down that loophole. Or you'd see a potential loophole and you'd want to close it. Um, now, so you have, pardon me, Oops, I did not hit uh, the mute button in time. <laughs> so sorry, get some cups. Uh, I'm going to show you this here. Um, let me blow that up a little bit, as Mr. Grizzly would say. So you have here, for example, hundreds of accounts claiming to be located in the United States, France, England, Russia, say they're still buzzing after attending Pierre Polyev's recent rally uh, in Crocodile Ontario. This is Luke Lebrun from uh, Press Progress. And we have uh, MP Mark Gerritsen says, uh, you know, who we had on our show say what we already knew, but now pretty much confirmed. Now, I like that politicians are seeing it and bringing it to the attention of their constituents, but there are things in there I did not see. Like I said, my response was, don't berate, legislate. While you're at it, please also legislate to count money spent by Canadians on merch as political donations. Creator only knows what kind of international dark money is financing the CPC hate machine via merch sales. Take action. Right, so again, I don't know what type of legislation can be put in place to say bot farms can't be done, uh, because you know, again, we're in an international world. If a party is intended on cheating, it's going to cheat, and you know, then they say, "Well, okay, fine, we just can't like hire somebody in Canada to do it or write a check from Canada or something." Like that. But hey, friends of ours, you know, from the IDU or wherever, like this, would you like to help us out here? Um, so I don't know what type of legislation it can be. Uh, Charlie Angus from the NDP has also been highlighting stuff. Uh, but again, I'm not seeing anybody proposing legislation, proposing rule changes, proposing caps, proposing anything. It's just sort of like, oh my God, isn't this terrible? Okay. Well, if it's terrible, like propose doing something about it. So you see these bot firms and it's like, you know, Elections Canada, is there something there for you to investigate? And maybe, maybe not. We're not actually in an election period, right? Um, the RCMP ceases. Is there something to investigate? You know, maybe, maybe not. You know, if it is foreign money, then yes, kind of falls under foreign interference and all that kind of stuff. But if it was domestically done or domestically paid for, then is it illegal? So we don't even know if it's illegal domestically to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, there's definitely you know media ask questions. Uh, there still hasn't been a major English language mainstream media yet um, that has picked it up. Uh, in French, however. Uh, it has been picked up. Uh, Radio Canada International, uh, no, sorry, not International, just uh, Radio Canada, uh, picked it up uh, yesterday. And uh, fortunately, thanks to uh, the internet, um, there is a version of it that is translated that I am going to read to you. Now, again, uh, I have not heard about it. I've not seen anything on CTV when I, when I last looked or CBC uh, when I last looked or any of the major networks, but Radio Canada in French. And you have to understand that uh, in French, um, there's cultural and journalism that's a, that's a little different. And in French as well, um, well, in Quebec, uh, the conservative uh, thing never took on. It never took on with Harper. They were the only province who didn't get lulled into it. Uh, they resisted him the entire time, never bought it. 
and uh, the same has happened with the uh, Polyev right now. So they are more inclined to report about this stuff um, if we are assuming that uh, that thing about the liberal dominated media was basically just mythology and that uh, mainstream language, English language, mainstream English language media really is all pretty much pro conservative. That kind of explains why this hasn't been covered yet. So, according to Sandrine Coté, have the conservatives hired troll farms to boost the popularity of their leader, Pierre Polyev? At least, that's what the New Democratic Party suspects, which is asking Elections Canada and the Ethics Commissioner to investigate a series of suspicious messages published on social networks. Okay, so the NDP has asked for things to be investigated, so the, the, that's good. That's a good start. The X platform, quote, was flooded with messages from people claiming to have attended Pierre Polyev's recent event in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, explains the NDP in a press release on Tuesday. And uh, they um, <clears throat> cite in the article, sorry, pardon me. I'm so sorry. I had uh, something stuck in my throat. Um, the Twitter feed uh, at at the two eighty times, so T H E two eight zero T I M E S. And uh, okay, so they they cite the tweet uh, that we saw on the show yesterday with uh, the whole list uh, in black, um, the black background with all the um, the montage or collage of all the the tweets and. Uh, you know, they were mentioned that they had eight full pages of this so far. The messages have identical wording and were generated by accounts claiming to come from Russia, France, and elsewhere, it is said. In one of the messages written in English and suspected of coming from a troll farm, we read, for example, quote, I just had the chance to attend the Pierre Polyev rally in Kirkland Lake and I was blown away by the energy in the room. As a Northern Ontarian, it is refreshing to see a leader who truly understands our concerns and is willing to listen to us. NDP MP for Timmins, James Bay Charlie Angus, believes, quote, these troll, foreign troll farms could be used, quote, to influence Canadian voters in favor of Mr. Polyev. Quote, this could be a worrying practice for what Mr. Polyev's machine has in store for the next federal election, he continues. This possible use of foreign troll farms is particularly worrying in the context of growing foreign interference in Canada. A public inquiry on the subject is also underway in Ottawa. Commissioner Marie-José Hugg's preliminary report published last May concluded that the 2019 and 2021 federal elections were indeed the subject of foreign interference, but that there were no impacts on the results of the election. A final report is due to be published next December. The publications on X raise, quote, questions for Pierre Polyev, he must respond, New Democratic leader Jagmeet Singh said Tuesday at a press briefing. Quote, was it the Conservative Party that did it? Because it's clear that there are worrying elements in these messages on social networks. If the publications were not ordered by the Conservatives, quote, we must have an investigation. We need to know if it was another organization that did it or if it was foreign interference, continued Mr. Singh. The NDP will send a letter to Elections Canada and the Ethics Commissioner on Wednesday asking them to shed light on the situation, added the New Democratic leader. Question on the subject at a press briefing Tuesday morning, Conservative MP Luc Berthaud completely brushed aside these accusations from the New Democrats. Quote, I find this completely ridiculous. It's a conspiracy theory that has no place, he says. Mm -hmm. Mr. Berthaud also made a point of recalling that his party has, quote, a zero-tolerance policy in matters of foreign interference. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I... I <laughs> I, oh, uh, I, I could, I, uh, <laughs> oh man, wow, he actually said that one with a straight face, I mean, the whole thing about India helping in the leader selection race, and literally, the party has a zero tolerance policy in matters of foreign interference. <laughs> oh girl you're so cute <laughs> I just oh my god uh, 
At the end of the day, Tuesday, the communications director of the PPC, Sarah Fisher, pointed out in a message that the same type of robot accounts also promote the prime minister message X and support. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Okay. The, <laughs> the CPC does not pay for these robots and has no idea who is behind these accounts, she further argued. However, for the NDP, Mr. Podiev's fake admirers have a lot to say about how the Conservatives treat Northern Ontario. Jagmeet Singh recently came to Northern Ontario and met with real people to hear their concerns. Pierre Podiev used our region as a theatrical prop to convey his angry speeches, denounces Charlie Angus. Unable to generate any momentum, it seems Pierre Podiev has had to turn to foreign troll farms and bogus accounts. It's low-level politics, and people deserve better, he adds. Charlie Angus, federal MP for Timmins James Bay for 20 years, announced last April that he would not seek a new mandate in the next federal election scheduled for 2025. He notably cited the redistribution of the electoral map as the reason to justify his decision. Um, now, that is um, basically... Um, what we had in the French media, let's put it this way, in Anglophone media, English language media, um, there was something, uh, but it happened again in uh, Sudbury.com. So, um, kits and cubs, if you want an, a good example of why it is that we should support local media. This is it. They had the interview with him that they brought to us in which he claimed not to know what Diagalon is, even though he filed a complaint with the RCMP 22 months ago because they threatened his wife. But now he needs their votes, so he doesn't remember any of that. Uh, and then they decided to run with this story. So, so far in English media, this is the only, um, yeah, of course, with press crop progress and all that kind of stuff, Luca LeBron brought it uh, up uh, yesterday. But this is the only additional one that I have uh, I've seen. Um, it says here, the Conservative Party of Canada is denying involvement in bolstering Pierre Polyev's recent appearance in Kirkland Lake using what appears to be fake social media accounts called bots. In the days following the Conservative Party of Canada's leader's tour of Northern Ontario, which included a stop in Sudbury, numerous accounts on X.com have posted about their experience. Pierre Northern Ontario tour is bringing people together. As a Northerner myself, I'm thrilled to see a leader who gets it. One post purportedly from someone in Wyoming read, Last night's rally in Kirkland Lake was electric. The packed crowd was a testament to his commitment to our community. Numerous or nearly identical posts from throughout the world were also posted to social media, prompting online ridicule, including one post on X.com parodying the situation by showing a large crowd of thousands of people purporting to have attended the Kirkland Lake rally. Apparently thousands of people, quote, apparently thousands of people from around the world converged on Kirkland Lake to listen to Pierre Polyev in a 200-seat curling rink, another person posted to X.com. Political cartoonist Chris Chukri posted an editorial cartoon to X in which Polyev is pictured surrounded by bot plants within a bot arm. <clears throat> and uh, get some cubs. Uh, I will take a little moment to show this one to you, because it's a... Uh, I personally like it. So it's, uh, it's basically uh, Pierre hiding in a whole bunch of sticks of bamboo uh, with the, you know, sort of like Rambo style, I guess. And then you see a whole bunch of cell phones uh, growing from the bamboo shoots, uh, all with uh, the word bot on them. It's a pretty good one, I have to say. I like it a lot. All right, back to the article. Um, the federal NDP weighed in, issuing a media release asking that the Conservatives hire bot farms for Pierre Northern Ontario tour. Pierre Poitier needs to explain himself, Timmins, James Bay, NDP, MP, Charles Angus said in his party's media release. Are the Conservatives using foreign bot farms to create fake momentum in Canada? This could be a disturbing practice run from for, practice run for what the Poitier machine has in store for the coming federal election. Sudbury.com reached out to the Conservative Party of Canada for their response, and they dismissed the NDP's comments as, quote, spreading baseless conspiracy theories. A little investigation will lead you to discover that the same type of bot accounts also promote the Prime Minister. Conservative Party of Canada Director of Communications Sarah Fisher said in an email, 
The CPC does not pay for bots and has no idea who was behind these accounts. We are seeking the support of actual Canadians, as witnessed by large in-person turnouts at our events. Like 14,000 people in a curling rink arena in Kirkland Lake. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> Sudbury.com asked Fisher for examples of cases where bot accounts were used to promote Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, but we did not receive a response. Bot accounts have been widely reported to primarily support right-leaning governments and were responsible for promoting Trudeau, the hashtag Trudeau must go in 2019. So-called spamouflage campaigns connected to the People's Republic of China have targeted dozens of MPs, including Trudeau, combination of spam and camouflage, the government of Canada wrote that it is intended to portray the hidden attempts to spread spam-like content and propaganda among more everyday human interest style content. So there you go. And uh, the, the statement uh, about um, Twitter's algorithm favoring right-leaning politics uh, stems back uh, to an uh, investigation that was done in 2021. And it, uh, if uh, you're reading the article, it links to uh, something uh, in the that was published in the BBC that um, says that uh, the claims of anti-conservative bias on Twitter's platform, because that was a big thing then. You know, the Republicans were saying that you know we're, our, our accounts or our messages are not uh, being uh, uh, shared or uh, broadcast as uh, equal on an equal footing. Um, and it turns out that that was actually not the case. The study had examined tweets from political parties and users sharing content from news outlets in seven countries around the world, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, Spain, the UK, and the US. It analyzed millions of tweets sent between April 1st and August 15th, 2020. Then researchers used the data to see which tweets were being amplified more on an algorithmically ordered feed compared with a reverse chronological feed, both of which users had an options of using. They found that the mainstream parties and outlets on the political right enjoyed a higher level of algorithmic amplification compared with their counterparts on the left. In six out of seven countries, tweets, tweets posted by the political right elected officials are algorithmically amplified more than the political left. Right-leaning news outlets see greater amplification compared to left-leaning. Establishing why these observed patterns occur is a significantly more difficult question to answer and something uh, Meadow will examine. Uh, so that was... a. Uh, from uh, Ruman Chowdhury, who was the, the director of Twitter's Meta Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency, and Accountability team. Um, so, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, spamouflage. Uh, I had never heard uh, the term before uh, reading the, that article, uh, Kit T. Wigmore. So, um, but yes. So, um, that's basically all the, the coverage that I have noticed. So, I'm hoping that major networks will have will do something uh with this uh now by having sent it to the ethics commissioner we know that there's probably going to be another day um when the ethics commissioner releases the report or there will be some uh news around this uh so we will it's an opportunity to hear about it again but It would be nice if there was uh, some type of move, like you know, like the conservatives keep on wanting to call committees back to do something. Maybe this would be an opportunity to call a committee back, uh, or you know, uh, when we open the uh, open the legislature, you know, uh, in September again, that uh, someone is uh, proposing some type of bill or something just to you know to have this in the media. Because uh, so if this, what's going on right now, if this is beta testing uh, for a broader strategy, if it happens to be that, um, uh, we, I don't, I don't know. It's like, the objective is to overwhelm us in some way. Um, and when people feel overwhelmed, they'll leave the public square, I'm guessing is probably the, the, the thinking. 
Um, and if we, like I said, I keep on saying, like, this is a moment where we have to stay. We have to, you know, uh, be prepared uh, to stay and, uh, and fight and say, you know, we understand that you want us to push us out of the square so that you can have all the room so that the only message and the only voice that's heard is yours. But no. No. Um, so, yeah, um, like I said, I'm, it seems that there are some investigations that have been requested. I don't know if any have been announced. But, the, uh, but yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be um, it's going to be an interesting election, and here's the thing: is you've got people saying, "Well, oh, now that Pierre is cheating, it's like maybe no, 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 not now, not now." Like we already know Pierre is a cheater; he has a lifetime compliance agreement with Elections Canada, and he comes from a party that has cheating in its DNA. The party, the Conservative Party of Canada, pleaded guilty in court. To the in and out scheme. It's like they're not adverse to cheating. That's right. They're not adverse to saying, well, finding a new interpretation of the rules or right. Uh, that's why the merch sale is always interesting to me because political donations are one thing, and that was the only thing people were doing, but now that uh, parties can have different types of revenue streams other than just political donations, how are those accounted for? That matters. Um, and while there are no rules yet, you know, people get to do, uh, do as they like, and... Uh, gains a temporary advantage and technically it's not illegal because it hasn't been legislated yet. So even though it's unethical, it goes out against the spirit of everything we agreed to. But if it's not written down to say that you can't do it, you can. That's one of the things about the law. If the law doesn't expressly forbid it, you can do it. So this type of stuff, we have to find a way to somehow forbid it. Um, with regard to um, fundraising, according to the Hill Times, uh, it says that uh, conservative fundraising is on track to smash their 2023 le record, but liberal donations, ad spending are ticking up slowly but surely because people are a lot of the media that's doing the horse race thing, when they're ca comparing that, they'll look at party uh, numbers and they'll say, oh my God, they're out raising them by so much. Again, they're inevitable. Um, we do have spending limits. So, right, no matter how much you raise, you know, you can't spend more. So all parties have to be able to do is raise the amount that they need to spend in the election. The thing is that all the additional money lets them do all this pre-election spending. Right. So, according to this, the Conservative Party raised more than $20.5 million in the first half of 2024, outpacing the governing Liberals' fundraising by more than $13.6 million so far this year, and its own total by this point last year, a record smashing four quarters for the official opposition by more than $4 million. Yet, with nearly $7 million in fundraising this year and nearly $3 million more in the bank at the end of 2023, the Liberals still seem to be holding their fire while the Conservatives and NDP fire shots across the bow with dueling cross-country ad campaigns launching this month ahead of two important September by-elections. Now, interesting here because even though the Conservatives are raising more money, the Liberals have more money in the bank. So um, Pierre's spending like a drunken sailor as the expression goes so all this talk about you know i'm going to manage the economy well um, when you add how his party funds are being spent and when you add um, everything that he's billing canadians that shows up on those quarterly statements uh, that we keep on seeing how he's billing so much more to run his operations uh, to the taxpayers than the prime minister um, 
This guy does not have, seem to have any physical discipline whatsoever. It just, it just really doesn't. <sighs> Yet with nearly 7 million... Oh, I mentioned that one already. In the second quarter of 2024, covering April 1st to June 30th, the Conservatives raised a total of $9.83 million, averaging $187 from 52,519 individual contributions. While that total amounts to more than 865,000, uh, to a more, sorry, while that total amounts to more than 865,000 decrease in fundraising, the party increased its individual contributions by nearly 1,500 compared to the first three months of this year. The Conservatives' $20.52 million combined fundraising total for this year is also well on its way to surpassing last year's record-shattering $35.26 million total, as it had only raised $16.27 million by the middle of 2023. While the Tories still maintain a more than $6 million lead on the governing Liberals, who raised $3.77 million from 28,523 individuals, that's the part that worries me. It's the number of individuals. Um... We're looking at uh, um, 52,519 for the Conservatives and 28,523. Um, so there are fewer, fewer people donating. Um, the GRIT's fundraising numbers are slowly ticking upward. Both the Liberals' fundraising and contrib contribution totals are slightly higher than their totals in the first quarter of 2024 and higher than any other quarter in 2023 and 2022, with the exception of the fourth quarter of those years. The Liberals were also the only party to improve both their fundraising and contribution totals. The NDP raised $1.29 million last quarter from 14,063 individual contributions, a slight dip from the $1.34 million from 14,699 in the first quarter of the year, for a total of $2.64 million so far this year. The Green Party of Canada had the fourth highest fundraising total for the quarter, with $376,076 from 4,210 individual contributions, followed by the Black Quebecois with 321,806 from 1,841 contributions. The People's Party of Canada also had its worst fundraising results since its formation in 2021, raising $140,000.57 from 1,850 contributions. Hmm, interesting. Former Liberal leader Kate LaForce told the Hill Times that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's brand has been struggling in recent years, particularly since Conservative leader Pierre Polyev took the reins of the official opposition in late 2022. This has discouraged support and donations and negatively affected polling year over year, with the Conservatives now polling between 15 and 20 points ahead. The force, now a senior consultant with Summa Strategies, contrasted those recent numbers to the peak of Liberal fundraising and support in the lead-up to the 2015 election and the early years of the Liberals' mandate, when the Trudeau brand was its strongest, and the year-by-year -year decrease since then. Similarly, the Conservatives' fundraising has surged since late 2022, riding on the momentum of Pierre election to leader of the party. The Conservatives are noticeably putting a lot of effort into a refreshed Conservative brand as well as elevating Polyev's individual brand, Lacoste said, adding that the party's investment in the rebrand has presumably had a positive impact on the increased returns on support. As part of the rebrand, the Conservatives spent $3 million on ads in the summer of 2023 in an attempt to reintroduce Polyev to Canadians. That campaign amounted to nearly half of the party's $8.5 million advertising spend for that year according to the party's initial annual financial returns for 2023, which Elections Canada posted online in early July. In comparison, in comparison the Liberals spent roughly 381000 on advertising in 2023, while the NDP spent only about 42000 So, um, yeah, that's uh, if you felt like you were being overwhelmed by the Conservatives or that the Liberals weren't in the game that year, uh, you would not be wrong. $8.5 million to 381000 Um, yeah, now maybe the Liberals thought that it was maybe a waste of time uh, and money to spend all of that money in two years before an election and that, uh, you know, attention spans are only such that uh, it's probably best to spend the money at another time. Um, but what the Conservatives are doing is the thing that they like to do best, which is to try to define someone and predefine someone. Um, so that's what uh, they're spending a lot of the time doing it, uh, trying to um, define their leader, uh, but also to try to define uh, the prime minister, which is a little harder to do um, because he's been around long enough. Um, but in terms of their definition, um, 
it seems that the tactic is more to solidify the negative impressions that people are already predisposed to have uh, among that group uh, than to try and sway people in this case. Um, so it's really to try to um, raise the specter of Trudeau being some type of uh, uh, evil menacing force uh, in order to motivate uh, the vote to get out uh, through that aspect than it is about uh, trying to uh, court anybody who might be a traditional progressive conservative uh, to add to numbers. Um, while the liberals may have far less to spend on advertising than the conservatives, it seems like someone's turned on the taps, if only slightly. Hogan, who has uh, said to GT and company principal Cole Hogan, Hogan, who has worked on digital ads for the Ontario for Ontario Premier Doug Ford and ex-Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, regularly tracks the federal party's advertising spending and one of the few social media, sorry, on Meta, one of the few social media platforms to publicize such data and make it available. According to Meta's ad library, in the 90 days before the fundraising numbers were released from May 2nd to July 30th, the Conservative Party of Canada and Pierre Polyev's official pages spent a combined total of 398295 In comparison, the Liberal Party and Trudeau's pages had spent a combined 78825 on ads, followed by the New Democrats uh, with 51639 However, in past months, the Liberals have begun increasing that spending week over week. Despite the Liberals' combined ad buy of 10618 from July 20th to 26, amounting to less than half of the Conservatives' combined 25852 it represents a nearly 50% increase from just over the 7000 it spent the week before, which in itself was a 105% increase from the 3500 paid in the previous seven-day period. So it seems that, uh, yeah, this would uh, confirm my impressions that it's uh, they've decided um, uh, to allow to take the hit of allowing PP to have all that runway um, two years ahead, and now are doing the the slow and gradual ramp up. Um, I guess strategically, the hope here might be that um, that by the time we get to the point where people who typically tune politics out um, decide to tune back in, um, that there's been so much of this conservative advertising and all of it is really, just really, really negative and heavy, um, that people might have had their fill and might be ready for uh, a different uh, type of message and uh, someone that has a um, much less of a hard sell approach to it it's a strategy um it, it's really too early to tell uh if it's a, if it's going to be a good one or if it's going to work while websites like google youtube and x don't offer the same level of transparency as meta hogan said that if parties are allocating a certain amount on one platform if they're smart they will be spending something at least parallel on the rest hogan said liberals ad spending is ticking up slowly but surely and that he would be watching for any rapid week-to-week -week jumps as an indication of an imminent election However, in his view, neither the liberal spending nor fundraising totals foretell a rich drop anytime soon. Yet even with a lower total than the conservatives' unprecedented fundraising success since Polyev became leader, Hogan said the liberals still have cash to spend. According to the liberals' annual return, it had $2.8 million on hand to finish 2023. They have the money to do it, so it escapes me why, why, they, why they are holding fire, Hogan said, adding that he doesn't buy the explanation that the lack of spending is due to a principled stance against negative attack ads. There's got to be a back room where they're pulling reactions or focus grouping about how people feel about Padiev and what his negatives are, Hogan said, adding that if that's true, he can understand why a single ad has not materialized from those efforts. The only thing I can assume is that they've done the focus grouping and nothing strong has come up, so they're not confident en enough to pull their money behind it. That's another theory. While the Liberals have yet to decide on a course of action to stunt Polyev's momentum and how much to spend on it, the Conservatives are expanding their lines of attack. The Tories uh, launched the Conservatives, sorry, launched a new cross-country ad campaign focused not on Trudeau but sell out Singh, as the 32nd ad released on July 30th dubs the NDP leader. The ad figures an image of Singh on the cover of a fictitious quote luxury pensioner monthly, accusing him of signing the confidence and supply agreement with the Liberals in March 2022 to delay the election until he qualifies for his pension. Singh, who was elected to the House of Commons in a 2019 by-election, will qualify for his pension on February 25th, 2025. A second ad released on July 31st reiterates that same line of attack, slightly varying from the previous ads, quote, Singh gets his pension, you pay the price. 
and he gets his pension, Trudeau gets power. Melanie Richie, who previously served as Singh's director of communications, told the Hill Times that despite the personal attacks, she views it as a good sign for the NDP. Quote, when a party that says it's going after the prime minister and his government spends time and money attacking you personally, that just means that you're on their radar. And that's where the party wants to be, Richie said now with Ernst Cliff Strategies. Quote, for the party, this says the conservatives know the choice in the next election will be between themselves and the NDP, and we welcome that. Unlike the Liberals, however, Richie noted that the conservative ads follow the NDP's own series of ads to launch the party's, quote, Change the Rules tour, which the New Democrats say is their largest pre-election ad buy since 2015. Richie said that while the party is adept at making every dollar count, having personally worked in elections in which the party had no money and still made it work, with the party now officially debt-free and with possibly a year and change to raise more money, she feels the NDP is well-positioned to challenge both the Liberals and Conservatives when the time comes. In the meantime, Richie said she has been told by the party that even more ad spending is forthcoming ahead of the September 16th by-elections in Elmswood, Transcona, Manitoba, and La Salle et Verdun, Quebec. As for the actual content of the Conservative broadside on Singh, Richie said going, pers- going for personal jabs suggests that it was the only available line of attack. Quote, they can't attack his record because they know people actually quite like the things Singh has gotten done, and the Conservatives have nothing to show for themselves, Richie says. They may think their ad is super cutting edge, but I think it just validates what Singh is doing. Ooh, damn. That's a little saucy. I like her. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see if we got uh, some uh, comments here from the kits here. Uh, got some, is there anything here? Just checking in with you. Bum, 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 bum. No. Nope, nope, not yet, not yet, nothing there. Okay, good, good. I didn't see anything here. Uh, there you go. Do you want me to get, no, that's not for about the thing either. Okay, then great, wonderful. Uh, so that's what we have uh, on the fundraising stuff and you know the, the kind of political stuff. I'll give you a little bit of a news you can use uh, before we have to go for the day kids and pebs um people uh the residents of uh, jasper um had an opportunity uh to go back and uh, take a look um they're not letting people drive in they're chartering buses and uh yesterday by yesterday at some point about 550 people had signed up uh, for the tours to uh go and take a look um the prime minister paid a visit to the wildfire command center in hinton meeting with fire crews and evacuees uh, he also met with uh, Premier Daniel Smith um, while he was there. Uh, Daniel Smith said, it's going to be a really big rebuilding challenge. I wanted him to see that Unified Command works and that he should trust us as a partner to be able to assist in that. Um, all the leaders were briefed on the wildfire response. Um, there's still about uh, 860 people trying to get the wildfire in the National Park under control. Um, so... Uh, It seems that there's been a change in conditions that have allowed uh, to get more people on the ground to help uh, fight the fire and that they're taking advantage of that uh, situation uh, to get people in places where they couldn't before due to because of a fire behavior. Uh, It's not safe for people to return home yet, which is why they're doing this uh, by bus. Um, And uh, Daniel Smith was saying uh, that uh, for some people, uh, it might help them um, when they see what is the situation, uh, help them uh, get the closure they need to move on uh, with a, a healing process. Um, she says that uh, the province looks f- towards uh, rebuilding and hopes to work cl- closely with the prime minister to get this done. Quote, because I think we'll be able to get permits approved, the development support that's needed, and be able to do things a lot faster with all three levels of government working together. Uh, she says that uh, the town of Jasper doesn't have a developing permit, development permitting department like most municipalities, but is working towards that so that the rebuilding can be done with uh, as few delays as possible. Um, on his visit, the prime minister did not make himself available for questions uh, from the media. And his office said that uh, he would not be taking a tour of the devastation just yet uh, out of respect for the people uh, who are grieving and uh, that we're preparing to go and uh, take a look uh, at uh, the state of their their homes. Um, 
so he'll uh, but uh, he'll probably be doing that uh, at a bit of a, a later date. Um, in the United States, uh, their um, uh, tropical storm Debbie have slam has slammed into the Gulf Coast as a Category One hurricane. Uh, oh, as a category, okay. So it's not, it has a, yeah. I think category one hurricane is still considered a tropical storm. I think if it gets a little higher, they should call it something else. And it turned deadly. That's the first hurricane to hit Florida this season. It made landfill uh, in the Big Bend region, and it dumped more than 12 inches of rain in some parts of the state. Uh, at least four people died, in, including two children. Uh, and hundreds, as usual, with these types of things, hundreds of thousands of customers are without power. Um, it has been since, okay, so it hit as a hurricane. It's been downgraded to a tropical storm since, uh, cutting a path through the Carolinas uh, yesterday, I guess, uh, bringing torrential downpours and historic flooding. Uh, both Georgia and South Carolina had declared states of emergency. Uh, don't know how it's uh, how or where yet it's uh, predicted uh, to hit in Canada, uh, should it come up. Uh, but that's what's happening over there. Um also talked uh, very briefly uh, about um, uh, yesterday, as you know, uh, Mr. Grizzly might have mentioned, the stock markets uh, are going on a, have been swinging uh, rather intensely. Um, the TSX had hit a, a big high one day that was, it went up by about 400 points one day, and then the next day it went down by 500, and then another 200, and then all around the world, like the Nikkei, uh, went down 12.4% on uh, what was the holiday money here, but then rebounded to 10% the next day. Um, and it seems to be uh, pri primarily based uh, about fears uh, of a recession in the United States because the United States uh, and has had data that's had slowing economy and a lot of people are um, expressing concern that the U.S. Fed did cut interest rates a little earlier than they have. Uh, some of them are even calling for an extraordinary meeting for the Fed to cut uh, some rates um, prior to its scheduled uh, uh, announcement on uh, in September. Um, it seems that um, most of the hit has come in tech stocks. Uh, so the NASDAQ got hit particularly hard. Uh, also in Bitcoin, uh, there was a huge drop in Bitcoin, over 10% or something, um, which is, a, again, um, you'll notice that a certain uh, candidate for prime minister is not talking about that a lot lately, Bitcoin. Um, but it, uh, so that's that's part of it here. Uh, the other problem that seems to be, or not, well, not problem, but a trend that seems to be an undercurrent is that um, uh, Japan, uh, rather than uh, lowering interest rates, raised interest rates last week and uh that caused some panic because um there's a lot of people um when you get in the markets at that level they will borrow money in a currency uh in a country that has a much lower interest rate uh and then um, um they will borrow money in that currency and then they will buy uh whatever stocks they want in that currency and therefore uh, the difference, uh, the savings that they get and what it would have cost to buy all that money uh, in American currency, for example, uh, they get to save that. And the, they make, they like buy lots of, lots of transactions, like in big dollar amounts. So when the interest rate suddenly goes up, um, uh, their bet doesn't become as profitable anymore. Um, and uh, they, they, often they borrow in order to uh, make those uh, currency purchases. So um, many investors borrowed against a low interest rate yen to fund higher yield assets, and now they're selling off stocks to pay back the loans. Suddenly, when we combine them with the other factors, they're saying, oh, maybe we better rebalance our portfolios, uh, says uh, one uh, financial uh, um, expert. Quote, he says, we're not talking about 1,000 here or there. It's billions of dollars. When they're doing that, so um, there's so yeah, two things: a bit of a, a tech bubble uh, bursting a bit, and um, some uh, shoring up, um, some uh, interest calls. I'm guessing uh, from having bought uh, in uh, currencies uh, that uh, 
that are exposed uh, to currencies that are affected by lower interest rates on the international market. Um, the other thing, uh, let's see what else is there. We mentioned uh, the river, yeah, the Chicotlin River. That's the thing I wanted to, to mention yesterday. Uh, well, I wanted to mention I was typing in the chat, but uh, Mr. Gris, I don't think I had a chance to mention it. Uh, the the landslide the, that Awika Bull blocked the river, and created a dam of debris, uh, basically uh, created a river that was about 11 kilometers long behind it. And eventually the pressure got too much and it eroded the blockage and that sent it a huge, sent a huge volume of water downstream. Uh, the, it, it's a powerful flow of water, so it's dragging debris along with it. Um, so people are advised to, to be cautious. Uh, the First Nations leaders uh, said that they're worried about uh, the salmon run um, because uh, the logs are, are also like, as the debris and stuff like that is also carving new paths uh, down uh, uh, down the mountainsides, uh, I guess I, guess, I don't know if it's just mountainsides or whatnot at this point, but they're they're carving new paths all the way through, so it's changing the landscape, and it's um, creating. If you're changing the paths, then salmon may, you know, go down uh, another path. Um, so apparently, the riverbank has. Uh, the charging waters have swept cabins from the side of the riverbank and uh, now is creating additional fear because now the salmon must not only try to find its way, but it has to swim through with obstacles and other debris uh, that makes it uh, more difficult. Uh, Joe Alphonse, who's the Sokoto, uh, I hope I got that right, uh, tribal chair, he's calling on the federal officials to shut down the coastal fisheries to protect uh, to protect the fish. Um, it says, facing this new hurdle, we need government to show leadership. Don't be sitting there counting your votes. Do what you have to do to protect the resource. Uh, he hopes, he's hoping that the Chinook salmon got past the slide before it blocked the river, but he doesn't trust government promises. Um, you know, there is no management, there's no control, so Canada and all these countries have to take a long, hard look at how they conduct their business, he said. Uh, the Department of Fishery and Oceans had not yet commented at the time I took the notes. Uh, but has spent millions combating illegal fisheries and protecting the salmon stock. Um, Chief Francis uh, Iakis of the Costco First Nation says that pollution is another problem. Uh, he said, talks about uh, rivers up there that are referred to as the garbage river uh, because the pulp mills up and down the river just pump whatever into it. And um, he said that uh, there have been uh, something that's called... Uh, dip nets which are rather labor intensive uh to try and preserve the salmon but you know you do the best you can with what you got right sometimes it's not enough um, but he saw on record as saying we don't fight for that fish for the benefit of the mighty dollar we do it in order to have food for our people so again it's uh there's the commercial fishery and then there's the there's fishing for subs uh, subsistence um, Scott Hinch of UBC Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Labs says the salmon will now have to fight the former silty water and floating debris to lay their eggs. Uh, quote, the large wood and the other debris that's coming down could interfere with the migration. It could be uh, ruining it. Sorry, it could be running it fish. What? Sorry. The large wood and other debris that's coming down could interfere with the migration. Um, the... The, and it says that it affects the fish's sense of smell to find their natal streams. That will change at least briefly, which can confuse them and can slow them down. And the, the debris is also concerned for communities downstream. Uh, the mayor of Hope, uh, Victor Smith, told uh, the CBC that his district is ready and expects that the river will absorb the extra flow. Uh, he said, uh, noting that uh, the water, quote, uh, the water actually this time of year is very low compared to what it normally would be. Uh, so there is a lot more room and capacity. But the big thing is the fact that in the river, you know, that there could still be a concern. So um, in this case, the pre-low law water level actually ended up being a benefit because it allows more room for the water that's rushing in to basically stay in without overflowing the banks. 
uh, it seems that the first wave of debris uh, has, uh, at the time of uh, writing down the notes, had not yet passed through Hope BC. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that's about the best I've got for you on uh, that at the moment, Kits and Cubs, but I will uh, definitely have more to say in the coming days because uh, this is going to go on for uh, a little while yet. All right, Kits and Cubs. I believe that we have a show. Uh, that's the end of this episode of uh, the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you. Remember that sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. And uh, well, you have the mouse from which we want the words to come. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Uh, if you would like to make sure you do not miss an episode, uh, please go to our pod page, podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And uh, if you click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, uh, surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page, getting very, very close to uh, 5,000. I believe uh, Kit pointed out that we are at 4,990 or something. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Thank you for your support. Uh, make like Kit Lane and click the buttons like, share, subscribe. That makes us very happy when you do it. So thanks so much. And if you'd like to help us in other ways, uh, the QR code that's uh, right there on the screen, that brings you to our coffee page, uh, which um, Mr. Grizzly wants me to say that it's our show fund, uh, even though I call it the emergency hydration fund. We know that I'm just playing. Can't be all serious all the time. <laughs> so, but if you can uh, have a little something change in your pocket and you would like uh, to uh, leave a few coins there for us to help us with uh, internet costs, subscription fees to services and all that kind of stuff and, uh, um, you know, help uh, build a little fun because we really would like to be able to hire somebody someday <laughs> to help us a little bit with this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Every dot count, every little bit counts, uh, and we really appreciate your contribution. So that's coffee, ko-fi.com slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, uh, all in one word. We appreciate uh, whatever that you can uh, donate. And um, let's see, what else? The gift of your attention, however, is the one that's the most important to us if you're not able to donate. We love to hear from you. True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com. That's where you can write to us, or you can leave a message on our Twitter feed at True Eager on our uh, YouTube pages or on our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver. Because democracy is something that you do if you happen to be living in the beautiful provinces of British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick, you have some provincial elections coming up. If you happen to be living in Ward 15, Toronto, um, get to know your candidates. That's all I will say. <laughs> I don't know how much I can say without it being considered uh, an illegal donation or anything like that. So there you go. Uh, Ward 15. And uh, of course, we have some by-elections coming up. La Salle Ville, Ville Mar, uh, Verdun and uh, Transcona. Um, so uh, if you're out there, uh, get to know your candidates or maybe call uh, your uh, uh, election organization to see if you can uh, volunteer at a polling station. Right? Ah, from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager Beaver saying, it could be a tough world out there, so please be kind to and gentle with yourself. Uh, words of wisdom. Um, uh, always take time for self-care. Always take time for self-care. Uh, and if there's somebody out there that's practicing some self-care, uh, give them the space to do that and uh, let them know that uh, if they uh, need a shoulder or an ear, that you're there when they're ready. All right. I think that's it for now. I will try this time once again to do the dismount. Uh, hopefully it gets to come back with a tiny little Easter egg. So uh, hold on, kids, and uh, let's see if I can uh, do this right. I guess, oh, yeah, I guess I should tell myself to uh, cue the cock. <laughs> that might be helpful. Okay. Here we go, let's try this. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, 
The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. All right, kids and cubs. Um, we have a little, uh, they played our song again at the Olympics, Cameron Rogers uh, in the hammer throw. Uh, apparently Canadians are good at throwing something other than a fit. So, <laughs> um, uh, incredible competition. Uh, unlike uh, the men's competition where Ethan came in and was one and done. Um, she had to make uh, four really good throws because uh, um People were pushing her. Uh, you know, she had the lead, and then someone took the lead, and so that the actually was like a, a bit of a some jockeying. Uh, but then on her fourth throw, um, she just like just, she got a really really good angle on the throw, and it just went flying, and just mm, a thing of beauty. Uh, so uh, another gold uh, medal for Canada yesterday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our basketball team flamed out. Uh, might be some questions here at uh, Basketball Canada, uh, because as we mentioned on a previous show, um, we seem to have had a good coach, and we decided to get rid of that coach in order to um, uh, bring another one in, and the coach that we got rid of is now leading Germany, and uh, well, uh, Germany's still in it, and uh, we're not. So, um, and Ger Germany surprised the world by winning the, the World FIBA title, uh, and we finished third, which is historic medal, but so, uh, you know, the, got rid of the wrong coach, maybe. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, there were, uh, um, the men's were uh, a strong medal hope. Our three by three team were a strong medal hope and our women's team, uh, are ranked fifth in the world. So could have created an upset, uh, and, uh, all three, uh, basketball, uh, formations for team Canada left, uh, without medals, uh, from, uh, the Olympics. Um, so. Uh, there might be some re-questioning at uh, Basketball Canada in terms of uh, leadership and uh, coaching to uh, give our players uh, the best uh, possible conditions uh, to be able to meet with success. Um, with uh, regard to Andre de Grasse, um, is, uh, as we mentioned, his uh, personal coach got uh, his accreditation removed uh, because... Uh, 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 complaints against him uh, for uh, manners he was interacting uh, with uh, his um, charges. Um, he, uh, he had been under suspension uh, in the United States for uh, having been at the age of uh, 44 in uh, some type of relationship uh, with an 18-year-old he was coaching. Um, he had served his full suspension and apparently had a assured everyone uh, that uh, everything, there was nothing else. Uh, but it seems that on Friday, uh, three uh, people in the state of Florida filed uh, new charges against him, which is what led to his uh, suspension. Um, so in this case, it is, uh, while I complain a lot, and I did initially complain because I thought it was this, because all the information wasn't out yet, that is once again, uh, people making an announcement based on information that was already out there and why doing it on the eve of the competition. In this case, it seems to be really legit. New information came out on Friday, and they took action. Um, you know, uh, within, uh, within days on that. Uh, so uh, that is uh, legitimate. Um, the other piece of good news uh, I want to mention before we go off is that in, uh, we talked about uh, um, Bangladesh and uh, that uh, the Prime Minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina, left after 15 years uh, in power because uh, the people pushed her out. Uh, it started as a protest against uh, a public uh, service hiring policy and then ended up being a wider protest to get her out because apparently uh, she has been um, uh, displaying more and more authoritative tendencies as uh, the years have gone by. 
Uh, so this is a population uh, led by students that have decided uh, we do not, uh, you seem to be wanting down, going down the autocracy road and uh, we don't want that. So you got to go. And she did. Uh, she fled to India. So uh, it seems that uh, at the request of the students, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Muhammad Yunus uh, will be leading the interim government. And uh, this makes me happy because uh, one of my favorite books in the whole wide world is a book called Banker to the Poor. And uh, if uh, you want a good read, uh, a nonfiction read, I really recommend that. Uh, Muhammad Yunus is the person that established the concept of the Grameen Bank or microcredit. Uh, so, uh, yeah. like today, you know, let's say let's say we needed uh, a, a two thousand dollar loan to buy a new computer. Uh, no bank will give us a personal loan for that, right? Uh, well, he created that concept of microcredit for all these people that like a farm, and you know, you know, you could bring more uh, food to the market if you were able to buy a wagon but you don't have a wagon you don't have the money for a wagon you need twenty dollars for that well they'll lend you twenty dollars at a very low interest rate and like the repayment rates are something like 98 percent uh so because people are not looking for right a handout they're looking for a hand up uh so making micro credit available to them in small small amounts at very low interest rates in order for them to be able to expand uh, whatever personal little businesses that they have uh or uh personal entrepreneurship uh, initiatives that they have to raise money for their families uh, and to feed their families uh, actually works. It's a really good program. Uh, it's a program I wish we had here. Uh, I think that there, you know, if there was a Canadian version of that, uh, it could work for people who are, uh, who are new Canadians. It could for work for people. Uh, it could work in the Indigenous community, I'm sure, to, to foster some into entrepreneurship. It could work uh, within the broader Canada for small small businesses, uh, self self uh, self employment businesses, um, you know, uh, it, it's a good concept. It, it's a good concept that could help a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, he's a he's a, seen as a hero uh, in his nation and somebody that does care about actually pe uh, actual people and wanting to make their lives better. So, um, this is a good sign in Bangladesh, and if we're looking again for signs of hope around the world, that people are rejecting authoritarianism and autocracy. Um, hey, look to Bangladesh. You never know where you're going to get inspiration, kids. You never know. The world's a big place. All right? Have a wonderful day. Bye.